been paying attention to what's happening in Dubai, that reality is here today. Dubai is actually piloting the first autonomous vehicles to actually transport people around the country. R2-D2 and C-3PO, right? From the very first Star Wars movie, they captured our imagination and created a vision that someday robots would exist in our daily lives and engage and operate around us, providing us with useful information to help us uh, do our daily lives much better, more accurately. <laughs> If you've been in a Lowe's store lately, you might actually think you've seen one of R2-D2's not-too-distant cousins, the Lobot. And if you would have went into that store, you would have saw the Lobot basically cruising the aisles, helping customers when it wasn't helping a customer find something, scanning the planograms, scanning the shelves for auto stocks, pricing compliance, and distribution voids. And a movie trilogy wouldn't be uh, complete without a little bit about Iron Man, right? Iron Man gave us a peek to what an AI assistant could actually do to help us in our daily lives. When it was that moment when he constantly gets himself into trouble, he's always calling out to Jarvis for the help he needs in that absolute last second. Jarvis, you there? That's your service. Uh, H has up display. Check. I'll tell you what, do a weather and ATC check, start listening in on ground control. So there are still terabytes of calculations needed before an actual flight is a Jarvis, sometimes you gotta run before you can walk. When you look at Jarvis and look at IBM Watson, right, you start to see some similarities in how an AI assistant can actually help run a business and provide information that we wouldn't have on our own. Uh, one of my favorite examples is the E.J. Gallo example, where they actually use Watson and satellite imaging to fundamentally change how vineyards manage their irrigation in their, across their, uh, their, their land. Hey, Dad, come meet the new guy. The new guy? What new guy? I hired some help. He really knows his wine. This is the new guy? Hello, my name is Watson. You know why, huh? I know that you should check Vineyard Block 12. Block 12? My analysis of satellite imagery shows it would benefit from decreased irrigation. I was wondering about that. So as you can see, movies do give us a peek at the future, and that future is here today if we take the time to look. What I'd like to do now is talk about eight disruptive technology categories that we're seeing having a significant impact on both the CPG and retail space. The first one I'm going to talk about is the connected home. If you look at the latest information from Gartner, there's more aggressive studies. I would argue it's Gartner's is probably uh, the middle of the road uh, from a device standpoint. But in just a couple of years here, by 2020, there's going to be an estimated almost 13 billion IoT connected devices around the world. So that's everything from your home security camera to your thermostat, to your garage door opener, to your pool, to your Alexa device. We go to CES every year in Las Vegas, which is the consumer electronics show. It's the largest tech show in the world. And this year, one of the areas you saw exponentially e increase in size on the show floor was the connected home, specifically the connected kitchen. Virtually every device in that kitchen 
in the very near future is going to be talking to each other and talking to you remotely through your mobile devices, whether it's you know, setting the oven remotely or starting it when you're not at home, whether it's the wash machine basically pinging you to tell you the drying cycle's done or it's time to take the clothes out of the washer and put them in the dryer. Um, a lot of people ask me, hey, John, what's a simple IoT device, right, that you can you know, explain to me? One of the examples I use is the Amazon Dash button. I don't know how many people have seen them or played with them, but it's a simple Wi-Fi enabled device. You connect it to your network, and by the push of a button, that device will actually reorder the product that's associated with it. The interesting piece of this one, and the reason why I like to use it, is Amazon has shared in a couple of different public forums that it really is creating sticky behavior for consumers to the tune that some brands actually get upwards of 50% of their replenishment purchases from the Dash button. Um, and if you don't like buttons all around your house, you can actually create virtual buttons in your app, so they don't have to be physical buttons. But same thing, instead of having to go through a search, instead of having to go through a cart, you can press that button and it will immediately order that product. There's tons of IoT connected devices around the home. Everything from security cameras to thermostats, a pan intelligence, one of my favorites for those of you that like to cook. It's actually a IoT connected frying pan that actually has an app that goes with it that allows you to pick an item to cook. I've done it with items like salmon. It'll tell you exactly the temperature, exactly when to flip it based on how you want that particular you know, fish or meat to come out. It allows an average person to become an incredible cook uh, overnight. And then Smart Things, another one of my favorites, is, was my first IoT hub. Smart Things was bought by Samsung. And the reason why it was so unique is Smart Things was the first kind of IoT hub for the home that was an open platform, meaning you didn't have to buy all your devices from one company. You could connect devices from multiple companies, everything from Wi-Fi to Zigbee to Z-Way. So it became uh, one of the leaders in a very short period of time, and now Samsung is bought. Another IoT uh, piece of connectivity that's growing like crazy is what we call conversational commerce, or voice. Right? And the one that's probably you know, most uh, you know, recognized is Alexa with Amazon, but we have Siri on our phones, we have Cortana on our Windows desktops. But voice is becoming a bigger and bigger piece as we watch it of how people transact and conduct commercial behavior. Now you might be saying, well John, why do you really need voice while you're sitting there kind of playing your Xbox or watching the football game? Well, I'd say you could use voice if something like this were to happen. Well, it's a reorder Doritos from Primair. Okay, look for delivery soon. So there are some uses. But importantly, there was a great study done by Cap Gemini on conversational commerce. You can get it off of the internet. It's probably the most comprehensive one that's out there. They really looked at not only why are people using voice-enabled devices, but what are they using them for? And you would expect a couple of things if you look on the, the left side of the chart here. Convenience, the ability to save time, etc. But some of the things in the study that really stood out for me is what people were doing with those devices. When voice devices started, it was primarily playing music, it was you know, telling me what the weather is, etc. We're seeing a bigger and bigger chunk of the activities actually being customers purchasing things through a voice-enabled device. And if you look in this room here, I took and highlighted the bars that actually touch a typical grocery store, whether it's household supplies, pet supplies, packaged foods and snacks, beverages, ready-to-eat meals. All of those items, believe it or not, are being purchased by folks with Echo devices in a pretty significant way at a growing clip. Now, another thing that's driving that behavior is folks like Amazon are offering incentives for people to go look to voice first. So I was an earlier doctor and was uh, tickled to find out that you could go talk to Alexa every morning and say, hey Alexa, what's my deals for the day? And you would all of a sudden get rattled off a set of deals based on your purchasing behavior that weren't on the website, they weren't in the emails, and as long as you ordered them via voice, you actually got an incremental discount through the voice device. Now a lot of people have asked me, 
well, how that works. And when I test people, they say they have an Alexa, and I ask people, well, have you really ordered something from them? What I find out is it's actually a small number of people that have actually gone through. So what I did, I was racing out of the house, uh, late as always, running to the airport, was grabbing my, my clothes, grabbing my vitamins, and realized I was out of vitamins. So I didn't have time to power up the laptop or open up the computer. So I went to Alexa and actually ordered my vitamins and recorded it. But this is what an actual transaction, this is actually a live transaction of me buying vitamins on Alexa. Alexa, I would like to place an order. What would you like to order? I would like to order Pure Essence Labs, one and only multivitamin for men. By the way, you have a $5 voice discount on this device. So it's $43.99 total after $5 in savings and credits. Would you like to buy it? Yes. Okay. Order placed and will be delivered by Wednesday, February 28th. And that's it. It's not it puts it in your shopping list. It's not it puts in your cart to look at it. It was that quick. I was literally in the kitchen, right? Put my phone there as I was finishing stuff up. It was able to order that product and have it delivered by the time I was back home. That's why people that are in an unbelievable clip are adopting voice once they see the value it can provide from a time savings and convenience standpoint. And in that same study, that same Capgemini study, another important piece that was identified, for those of you that study net promoter scores, companies, whether it was CPGs or retailers, that had voice assistance so versus having to go just to a static web page, having a voice assistant you could interact with, had a significant increase in their net promoter score. And for those of you that manage this space, that's not an easy number to move in double digits. And voice is one of the levers that you can use. The smart kitchen is also where the connected home is really coming to life. Samsung um, is one of the leaders in this space. LG, Philips are all uh, catching up at a pretty a big clip. But Samsung was the first to come out with this refrigerator that had this large kind of LCD panel on the front of it. And they, they added some capabilities that got a lot of people's attention. The first one is they put a camera inside the refrigerator. So instead of being in the aisle like all of us, it's like, oh, do we have milk at home? If we have milk, how long has it been in there? You're able to literally, on your smartphone, go into your refrigerator remotely or from anywhere in the world and see what's in there right on your mobile device. It's also internet connected, so you can, if you do home delivery or e-commerce grocery shopping, you can actually order your groceries there or add to your shopping list as you empty a package and throw it in the trash in the kitchen. It's kind of the hub for the family, so there's a calendar there where everybody can see what's going on. But you're seeing folks like Microsoft even take it to the next level, level, level by actually inside those cameras, instead of having to go look at them, they're embedding AI and machine learning capability to actually identify the products that are in there. So when you think of the, the, the importance of this around how long was it in there? How old is it? What about auto replenishment of things that you want in your refrigerator? We're starting to see the first pieces of the technology to put that together. And then Samsung had an interesting um, concept there about two years into it now with what they call Big Speed. And it's their vision on how this whole connected home um, fits together. Now, some people may say it, maybe it's a little creepy because their vision is you have the smart refrigerator. You have a smart app on your phone that through AI, you can just point at your plate and it can identify what's on your plate, the calories, et cetera. It can tell you what exercise you need to actually burn off those calories you've pointed your phone at. It tracks whether you did that exercise, right? And it basically puts this thing into a closed loop cycle. So meal planning, kind of what's in your refrigerator, are you exercising, and kind of giving people visibility to the calorie in, calorie out argument and can get people to understand that. And they've just done one of the best jobs of putting it all together. So if you close out the first chapter here, what I tell you is there is a ton of inspiration from consumer IoT products that you can bring into the business world. Quite honestly, some of them are lift and shift. Um, you don't have to have the enterprise kind of device to go do a lot of these things, especially to learn on a small scale. Um, the big change here, though, is you really have to understand your organization's ability to actually read these signals, warehouse these new breadcrumbs of information, and then do something with them. Because they are going to fundamentally change how we manage the supply chain end-to-end. -end. 
Um, retail is another place where we're seeing tons of innovation from an IoT standpoint. One of them um, that we're seeing a lot of energy around right now is through cameras, through both fixed cameras, cameras on robots, cameras embedded into shelf rails, cameras embedded into coolers, which is some of the things we're testing, but that allow you to have a peek into a device or an aisle remotely from a control tower that would give you the same visibility as being in, in that store directly. So think of the power of that, right? And maybe not every store or every aisle, but key sections. Through a control tower, being able to real time see what shelf conditions are. Um, we're doing some testing with coolers with actually inward facing Bluetooth cameras that are fairly low cost, you know, in the $100 range, that allow us to remotely, anytime a door opens up, take a picture of that inside of the cooler, not the person, just what's inside, be able to check for planogram compliance, out of stocks, check how many times that door was open. So you get really, really granular on traffic and how productive are the equipment that you're putting in those stores. Not to mention all the basics of what we would call telematics around coolers. You know, is the compressor running? Is the light on? Is the temperature correct, et cetera? All of that becomes a, a possibility in an IoT connected world. Um, and tracks that NRF for the last couple of years, they, they, they debuted it last year, and it was something I think. Um, is, is pretty unique, which is a, a small connected camera that actually snaps into the existing gondola shelf rail that's battery operated so you're not having to run power and run, you know, Wi-Fi or internet cable, Cat5 through your store. You're able to literally put it up on the, on the bottom of the shelf. And the reason why I think these are so interesting is I believe the future world is a blend of autonomous robots in the store and a small set of fixed cameras that are in those super high velocity or high theft sections within the store that you just can't get the cycles with the robot to go hit them at the frequency that you want. And I think things like the track shelf rail camera are one of the tools that are going to make that possible. Folks like PowerShelf have been out there that continue to refine, continue to develop their smart shelf, which is a weight sensitive map that allows you to real time identify if a product runs out of stock. It's tied to a smart label, so the shelf tag identifies that it's out of stock, but it's wired electronically to, within less than 60 seconds, basically fire off a text message to whatever routing you set up that says, hey, you're out of this particular product in this particular <laughs> store. And that's where these technologies are heading. There's some work to be done around getting some of the price points down, but it's coming down um, at a pretty rapid clip. Um, another interesting development uh, was the launch of Sunrise Technologies by Kroger. Last year they were at NRF, they kind of shared with the public their Edge shelf, which is in essence IoT to the, the end of the, the shelf in the store. And now they're kind of taking those assets and putting them together into an operating group and making those products available to other retailers. Um, if you haven't seen Edge, to me, you got to understand what it's doing. It's not just you know, a little LCD panel that's running a movie or running an advertising clip. It's an addressable IP address at the product store level. And you gotta really understand that if, if the power of that if you're a marketer. That means you can talk to somebody in front of the Dorito section in a given store at a given time of the day or target even a given consumer because the shelves actually through Bluetooth Wi-Fi can, can actually identify people through their mobile device. And what's interesting about it is just the amount of, of engaging content that you can actually put on it, right? So whether it's, you know, engaging content around our products for Super Bowl or a promotion for the 4th of July or Memorial Day, right there on the end cap with the price points. And as more and more information is being desired by consumers around shelf labels, how do you like to have a shelf label that's that big to be able to tell somebody, is it gluten free, is it GMO free, etc.? And things like Edge allow folks to go do that. It's an incredible to see, and you can see some of the big labels there on the bottom. But also, there's all the things connected with it. So for you know, for you know, click and collect kind of grocery operations, it can identify for the picker where the item is on the shelf by making it turn red or draw an outline on it. For a consumer with their shopping list, they can hit their app and it'll show them on the shelf where that product is. Um, there also were a lot of, I would say, lower cost, smart kind of shelf tags at NRF this year. And they're every year seem to be coming more and more creative. Where we started with the, you know, kind of the, the, the light gray ones that weren't highly engaged to stuff that looks like this. It looks like, you know, the, the produce manager took out the marker and actually drew on these things. They can display things like QR codes, et cetera. 
But again, all IoT connected, so you can manage your price changes, your price compliance electronically and understand where you, where, you, where you stand. It's not only engaging for consumers, obviously there's a ton of productivity there by being able to do that in an automated way. Um, beacons are another place that we're spending a bunch of time, we're finding a lot of value. The cost of Bluetooth beacons continues to drop and drop and drop. And we're able to actually tag assets, both permanent assets and temporary assets, to understand compliance. Did our reps get them in? Did we comply with the display plan for that store? If it's a hard asset like a cooler, is it in there? How long has it been in there? But it allows us then to actually take and roll that data up through different dashboarding tools to be able to manage that performance at a whole new level. And then and the, I would say one of the big eye openers in the IoT world over the last couple of years was actually what Amazon did with Amazon Go. This vision they set to say, hey, we picture a retail world, right, where there isn't checkout lines or people having to, you know, wait to go queue up to go, you know, get their products. It's a store where people come in, grab what they want, and actually go. Four years ago, we started to wonder, what would shopping look like if you could walk into a store, grab what you want, and just go? What if we could weave the most advanced machine learning, computer vision, and AI into the very fabric of a store so you never have to wait in line? No lines, no checkouts, no registers. Take whatever you like. Anything you pick up is automatically added to your virtual cart. If you change your mind about that cupcake, just put it back. Our technology will update your virtual cart automatically. <laughs> so, how does it work? We used computer vision, deep learning algorithms, and sensor fusion, much like you'd find in self-driving cars. We call it Just Walk Out Technology. Once you've got everything you want, you can just go. When you leave, our Just Walk Out technology adds up your virtual cart and charges your Amazon account. Your receipt is sent straight to the app, and you can keep going. Amazon Go. The reason why I share that too, some people might be saying, well, but John, we're not Amazon, right? We don't have the same resources, et cetera. And I would tell you, you're not gonna have to, right? There's at least four different companies that we're talking to, one we're actually working with closely in Israel right now, that have Amazon Go-like solutions that they're commercializing for basically any retail format. And they're not just, you know, on drawing boards, they're in labs and they're working at an unbelievably high accuracy rate and are in the final uh, tuning stages. Some of them already have commitments with some big national grocers. So this whole idea of, you know, autonomous retail, it's coming and it's coming fast and it's not going to be something just that Amazon has. It's going to be democratized across the industry. They're opening up these stores at a rapid clip. There's all kinds of rumors of numbers. They won't uh, publicly say how many, but you know now up to six stores in Seattle, which is where the first store was. Um, they actually have a couple in San Francisco and are up to four stores uh, now in Chicago. And the one thing I tell you is, anytime you have something like Amazon Go that's successful, you always have people that knock it off, right? You may have seen this particular startup uh, that's come up with their version of Amazon Go. Four years ago, we started to wonder, what would shopping look like if you could walk into a store, grab what you want, and just go? Hey, hey, hey! No lines, no checkout, no paper trail. Welcome to Anything Goes. While our competitors at Amazon use deep learning algorithms, sensor fusion, and fabricated techno battle to track your every move, our app uses our very own patented technology we call Stealth. We recommend wearing a large jacket for seamless transportation and a low angled hat for increased security. Anything goes. No lines, no checkout, no seriously, go steal stuff. We don't laugh enough. We can thank our friends at Rooster Teeth there. If you've never seen their site, they have some incredible videos. Uh, but if you, if you close up kind of IoT retail, the takeaways I would say, folks in this room, is we're moving from you know a kind of past of red, yellow, green Excel spreadsheets that we send to each other to shelf-aware dashboards. 
where we're going to be able to see in kind of control towers and headquarters across the chain exactly what's happening on a real-time basis in those stores. It's going to require different infrastructure, obviously, to be able to leverage these systems. Things like the emerging 5G technology is going to be a big enabler. For those of you that aren't familiar, I could probably do a whole session on that. You know, it isn't 3G to 4G, right? That's what we experience. This is a 20x improvement in speed. It's actually faster than anything that anybody has connected to their house today through fiber or through cable. And it will enable a lot of these, kind of these, these connectivities. And it's happening in the next 12 months here in the US. Um, in order to really unlock these capabilities too, you have to collaborate with your trading partners, right? If this data is available and nobody acts on it, all we're doing is piling up more data. The question is, can you turn it into exception to prompts or alerts for a rep to go in there and immediately fix a distribution void or an auto stock? And really get to this point where it's not just real-time scorecards, it's automated interventions. Where when this happens, here's the corrective action. Somebody else doesn't have to go read the email or, or go through the report. So the third one, in-store robotics, incredible amount of in innovation here. We saw in the opening video with Fellow, Savio, Symbio with Cali, which is a one that uh, has come a long way and is one they really spent a lot of time engineering the price point on. And then um, at the event, Bossa Nova's here. Uh, and publicly, I think many of you have heard they're partnering with Walmart around a bunch of tests with robots in their stores. But they really do create a whole new set of capabilities, right? I grew up in a grocery store, as Art said, I started as a bagger, ran kind of all the departments, ran stores, and then ran uh, pricing, weights and measures out of headquarters in Melrose Park for Jill. And I used to think of just the price change activities, the amount of labor it takes to go into a store, yet to every day be able to see multiple times per day what does every section look like, what does every planogram look like, what are the out of stocks, pricing compliance, until robots, it's just cost prohibitive to go do that. And there's lots of choices. Another one that was up at NRF that I was pretty impressed with this year was Badger, where they actually uh, have, have gone public with some of the work they're doing with giant markets and stopping shops. And they're having a little more fun with it, right, to make it a little more engaging for people in the store. So when they see it, you can kind of see the personalities. More and more of these robots have names and have eyes and all those kinds of things. But it really is a whole new set of capability around retail data that's able to be able to be gleaned and the insights in dashboards. So these aren't just kind of prototypes that are out there. They have hardwired tools that really allow you to see and act on the data they're consuming at store level. So if you, if you look at it, robots can create completely new opportunities to up your game from a customer service standpoint. When I share this with people, I would say the biggest tragedy with automation is if you just try to grab all of it as a productivity play, it ought to be an opportunity to step up the consumer experience, right? So if you don't have people doing some of those mundane tasks, how do you get them to be more engaging in the aisle? How do you have the five foot rule that people really live and breathe by or that are talking to people day in, day out? It does allow you to automate a lot of manual processes, but most importantly, to get real time insights to what's happening across the chain multiple times per day. A typical implementation that I've seen for retailers will have about three cycles of the store per day where they're actually picking up data and actually walking the entire store. Uh, some of that robots today actually also do display compliance, some don't, but all of that stuff is gonna continue to advance. Um, crowdsource delivery is another one that's growing like crazy. Um, a few years ago, I think, you know, people would have scratched their heads and say, how are people really going to, is there going to be enough people to go do these crowdsourced jobs? And you see folks like Instacart that year after year, right, outperform everybody's expectations. They're getting a ton of venture capital put into them. But one of the things, if you really look at what was the big shift in, in an Instacart or a Shift or a Postmates, was they lifted a play from the Amazon playbook. When all of these services really took off, they all moved to a subscription model, where when they just started, it was a flat fee for, for delivery. But just like Prime, and I'm a Prime member, right? You have it, so it's like, well, I made that investment. You kind of default there and say, well, hey, can I get it from Amazon first? It's no different with Instacart. You make the commitment, you do the $99 Express subscription, and as long as you're willing to order more than $35, the deliveries are free, so there's no extra cost. So once you do it, Right? There's a, a big incentive to keep using it to get the value, 
but also it gets back to this point similar to the dash buttons. It creates this frictionless commerce, right? It creates a very simple way for folks to get their goods. And it doesn't mean they're gonna get every piece of their grocery order. They may do it for you know, a couple of, of, of orders throughout the month and they may wanna go in and still get perishables or fresh things. But this subscription-based service is what really is driving these things. Um, Shipt, uh, who was a, an early competitor um, to Instacart after they had launched, uh, Target, I think many of you are well aware, bought them and has made them a big piece of using the stores. Brian Cornell, who keynoted at NRF, um, who I used to work for, he's ex-PepsiCo, um, really talked about their strategy of making the hub really the center of their kind of e-commerce model, really trying to own these you know, hundreds and hundreds, thousands of locations they have as being warehouses that are in the most close proximity to the shopper. So if you can figure out the delivery side, if you can figure out the fulfillment side, and I'll show you some neat stuff that's happening there, that's really the unlock to a space that candidly has been challenged from an economic standpoint. We're starting to actually see the technologies and testing the P&Ls where it actually has the capability to be more profitable than what happens in the front side of the store. But same thing, um, implemented a subscription model which really took off. Postmates is another one. They're real popular if you have college kids for restaurants, things like that. You'll see it on your credit card bill regularly. But what they're starting to do is get into groceries because it's, again, it's about frequency, it's about trips. They're realizing that, hey, with the presence they have, they can actually do groceries and in many cases do groceries at a quicker turnaround than some of those other companies. They actually, on their website, will say, hey, if we're up and we're in your market service area, you can get groceries and alcohol in less than an hour. Right? That's a huge commitment when you think from the time you pick it, select it, and purchase it to have it delivered to your house. So as far as crowdsourced deliveries, it should definitely be something you look at. The reason why I think it's so attractive for a retailer of any size, right? And I can speak from firsthand knowledge, we manage a huge kind of go-to-market fleet with our DSD systems around the world. You gotta be all in to go do that and manage those costs and train those people and all of the safety aspects. These crowdsourced delivery mechanisms allow you to get that capability without having to put that on your balance sheet or all of that complexity and cost of trying to go get to that end consumer. And again, they create sticky behavior. That's the one thing we keep hearing as we talk to people is when the people do the subscriptions, they tend to use them more. And I think we're seeing innovative ways people are using it, like maybe testing the expansion of a service area where you're not sure you wanna put brick and mortar in the ground yet, being able to expand with Instacart to a whole new geography to see if there's, you know, there's an uptake there for your brand and for your products. Um, drones is another interesting area. I think Jeff Bezos captured all of our imaginations on the first 60 Minutes show where he talked about you know, this vision of drones delivering product to your house. And it really kicked off a ton of innovation across the industry. Now what I tell you is his original vision of these drones flying all around um, outside you know, in front of our houses is still a little bit off. The US is actually behind a lot of parts around the world where people are already doing drone delivery. But what it did is it drove a ton of innovation in two places. Actually drones inside our four walls in warehouse operations, I'll show you in a second, but also a whole new kind of family of drones, which is ground-based drones, where we're seeing the most activity right now and the closest kind of commercialization in a number of different spaces. So one technology example, there's more than one player, I'm just sharing the ones to give you an idea. Uh, there's a company called IC. Right? For those of you that have warehouses that, you know, have a bunch of inventory pallets of product, it's some cycle, whether it's weekly or monthly, it's a very manual process today to have somebody with a handheld kind of RF gun scanning pallets to make sure you understand what's there, what's the freshness, what's the inventory levels, et cetera. These drones are able to be programmed and literally let go in the warehouse and automate all of those activities.
grocery retailers in the us that are actually testing them in their warehouses today with a whole lot of success but this this next family of drones that we're seeing a lot of uptake in is ground based drones and the first one that i think caught everybody's eyes was a company called starship technology there's an estonia based company and you know they kind of came to market with their partnerships with postmates it was postmates kind of first kind of pilots with drone uh, ground based drone delivery to actually deliver you know meals from restaurants without having to have somebody in a car or on a bike from the restaurant to his front door and Breslovin's sandwich was just delivered entirely by a robot. I mean, all I did was come out and open a robot, grab my food, and it's quite easy. Food delivery company Postmates says it's the first service in the U.S. to use a fleet of robots to deliver food. The cooler-sized machines are now roaming the sidewalks of Washington, D.C., waiting for an order. Customers can go online or use the company's app to order a meal. The robot then heads to the restaurant using an array of sensors and cameras to navigate the sidewalk. The system creates a digital map to remember trouble spots, and it can even read electronic signs at crosswalks. An employee loads the food into a locked compartment and sends it on its way to the customer. Russell Cook is Postmates Senior VP of Operations. The company is currently rolling out the service in D.C. as well as Redwood City, California, with plans to expand. It lets us drive down the cost of delivery by 80 to 90 percent over time. Um, which... That's probably the most important piece of that video is what he just said there, where everybody said, oh, you're never going to be able to do that based on the cost. Once you take the person and the labor out of the system, what he said is they can drive down their cost of delivery 80 to 90 percent. Right? And that's where you start to see the power of this technology. Now, they started with Starship, but in mid-December, uh, Postmates actually put out a press release, so this is only about a month old, where they actually had actually developed their own internal in-house drone. It's actually called Serve, and they actually try to make it more, they call it more uh, socially aware, right? You see the eyes there and it has a ring on the top that actually communicates you when you uh, work with it. But these things can actually carry about 50 pounds, go about 30 miles. They have cameras and sensors that interact with the people um, that do that. So for example, it has dynamic eyes in the front and actually a, a light ring around the top and they're connected to the mobile app, right? When your, your order gets there, the app allows you to open it up securely. But that's where they seem to be headed. Uh, Amazon also a few months ago actually launched um, their first pilot uh, on something you call Amazon Scout. It's up in uh, Washington. Same thing, it's running during the weeks, but they're trying to understand again the ability of these ground-based drones. So you're really starting to see these go into live pilots of significant scale. So they're not just being talked about anymore. In our own, right, with Roby, you guys may have heard, uh, we actually uh, launched something called the Snackbot. Um, it's actually live right now on the uh, University of Pacific campus in, uh, campus in Stockton, California. And what it allows us to do is, again, through a mobile app, have people be able to order out PepsiCo products and actually have them be delivered to set locations around the campus without somebody having to go hunt down a vending machine um, on the campus. And it's focused around uh, our Hello Goodness line, which is our healthier kind of product line. Here's what it looks like. PepsiCo working with robots, just like anybody in this room, I'd encourage you, the way you learn about these technologies is to get real pilots up and running. Understand how the consumers interact, how do they behave, what's the technology reliability, what are the downfalls, but this ground-based technology is really growing at a significant clip. The other piece of growth that we're seeing that really is going to bend the cost curve 
on e-commerce grocery fulfillment is micro-fulfillment technology. One of the, the ones you hear a lot about is Ocado. Many of you probably have heard about their partnership with Kroger. And what these new technologies are, are, are bringing to market is ways to actually drive fulfillment costs down considerably versus somebody manually picking in a store. Now, Ocado, you, get, you hear a lot about, but um, in its simplest terms, for those of you that have some background in warehouse technology, it's a goods-to-person warehouse technology. So the only difference is, instead of shuttles that go down aisles in a warehouse, which is how most of the large kind of automated systems from Vitron or Schaefer or, or Dematic work, the Ocado system uses a, sense, a set of robots on the top that actually grab the tubs from the top of a queue. Now the reason why they did that is density. You can fit a lot more kind of product in a smaller area by being able to basically stack it up. What you give up is you have to be really good in the AI that actually runs it to minimize the moves because you're constantly moving, picture of you know, one of the sliding puzzles. You're having to move tubs around to get what you need to bring it to a goods to person station where somebody is either picking it, they're also testing some automated picking, but it's really a goods to person system but right now, their system's a fairly large scale uh, kind of operation. The ones that I think would apply to people in this room, there's two companies, one called Auto Store, and as you look at it here, has a very similar look and feel of what Ocado is, but Auto Store can be scaled from anywhere from two robots to 200 robots. Similar concept, right, a vertical kind of grid that actually picks the product so you can actually put it into the back room of a store. And uh, seeing a lot of uptake here, um, they're making more traction internationally right now. But the one that's here in the US that I had the, uh, the, uh, the fortunate ability to go see about three weeks ago in Miami, is, it was actually um, on the tail end of the FMI midwinter we had, is a company called Takeoff Technologies. And they've partnered with one of the large material handling companies called NAP to actually come up with a micro-fulfillment system that again, if you just put numbers around it so you can kind of visualize it, the actual hardware itself, so what's called the pick buffer and the pick storage, fits in about 4,500 square feet in the back room. The operation they have, and this is all public, you can go look on the website, they have it at a, a really popular Hispanic retailer down there called Sedano's, and they actually have it in the back room. The whole setup was an existing store, they just moved a wall a little bit, so the rest of the store is still there functioning. They, the staging area, all of the other stuff for you know, frozen dairy and stuff like that takes up a total of about 10,000 square feet. But what it allows you to do is high speed automated fulfillment in the back of a grocery store. For years, grocery retailers have struggled to find a profitable e-grocery business model, searching for a compelling online value proposition to offer their customers. The two major challenges have been the cost of picking products and the cost of the last mile. Until now, at Takeoff Technologies, we decided to solve these challenges and turn e-grocery into a largely scalable, profitable, and compelling business for retail. Our vision is simple. Through automation, we can shrink an existing supermarket into an ultra-efficient and hyper-local fulfillment operation while maintaining or potentially decreasing the existing retail footprint. To do this, we partnered with Kanaf, a global technology leader with proven picking automation and designed a scalable micro-fulfillment solution. We also developed an extra layer of artificial intelligence to ensure the right picking method for the right product. From tender lettuce to breakfast cereal, our solution has the flexibility and capabilities to manage the many complexities that exist in grocery and by locating the micro-fulfillment centers within the existing store footprint, we can leverage underutilized retail space, which solves the second challenge of e-grocery fulfillment, the last mile. We can decrease this cost by being close to the shopper with hyper-local operation. With Takeoff Technologies, the dream of a truly profitable e-grocery solution is now a reality. <coughs> Get ready for the future of e-grocery. Get ready for Takeoff. It's really an amazing technology to see live in the back room of the store, to see how it's been scaled down. The goods-to-person technology systems have always been out there, but they've been huge operations. 
And they've thought through just about everything, including in-market in, in, in serviceability with technicians and stuff like that, to really make sure that the process sticks. So if you, if you wrap up drones, what I would tell you is both aerial and ground drones are becoming a reality. Aerial drones, mostly inside our four walls, ground-based ones around delivery. They really do have the ability to totally transform that last mile logistics cost. And also have the ability even inside your operations, whether it's spare parts or even shuttling things around your stores. And the only way to learn is to start testing with drone partners. Autonomous vehicles is another one that's, that's growing like crazy. And we actually have, there's some vendors here at the show, we'll, we'll talk about a few of them. But we're seeing the technology not only on large articulated vehicles like tractor trailers, but also you're seeing new innovative kind of power units like Tesla moving into kind of the, the transportation field with you know, their new offering. You know, we still are probably a year or two out from getting delivery on them. But again, all of them with autonomous vehicle capability um, and actually um, electric powertrains, which will um, be interesting to see from a sustainability standpoint and their cost and return. Auto X was here at the show. They're one of the, the players that are working on grocery delivery using what I would call more consumer vehicles that we're aware of. I believe they're use, using Lincoln MKSs to actually deliver that, operating in two zip codes in San Jose. There's a number of different providers. So back where I live in Texas, I live by the Star, which is where the Dallas, or Dallas Cowboys headquarters are. There's a company there called Drive AI that actually has autonomous vehicles running that you can actually call with the app for free and actually get them to shuttle you around. Um, and until you've ridden in one, you really don't, un I mean, it, it comes to life once you've sat in one and had one drive you around. And they've done a good job thinking through all of the, how does it really work? Like panels that require you to enter a code to make sure it's you before the door opens up. Signs that let people know there's people exiting and are entering the vehicle. Um, also folks like you to live, they've done a nice job um, creating a vehicle that can actually do grocery home delivery. Robomart, they were actually testing in, in the California area, their claim was very similar to an Uber. You would have an app that would show you rover monitors that are out there driving around. You could basically, you know, call one up and you actually get fresh produce brought to you through the app, pick it and actually, you know, just take it out and it goes on its way. You may have seen they actually announced a partnership with Stop and Shop. So they're going to be testing the, the, the RoboMart technology there in a couple of different ways from produce meal kits and has the capability to do obviously grocery delivery. We've done some testing outside of the US on the Pepsi side with an autonomous smart car. Again, to try to get, understand kind of what are the mechanics of, of, of driving it from a safety standpoint, but also what are the means in which you engage consumers? So this was for a, a music event. We actually use Facebook Messenger to allow people to actually talk to the vehicle and get responses. Um, Kroger announced a partnership with Neuro, which is again, more, more of the ground-based technology, but you can see the form factor differentiation. You have people that are either using kind of more traditional kind of vans and consumer-grade vehicles, and then the folks that are using more of the lower profile tend to be kind of alternative power sources, electric in most cases for delivery. And I think you're gonna see these take off sooner just because the risk factor is lower. They don't go as fast, they're not as big, they tend to, you know, drive, they don't drive on the expressways, they're driving on local roads. So we're seeing a lot of uptake there. And then Uber, if you talk about just in general, the way autonomous transportation is going. So you saw in the beginning what Dubai is doing with Holocopter, and they're, they're making a lot of progress. But at CES this year, you got a peek into what Velk Helicopter is thinking about this space. And if you haven't seen it, here's a quick little video that says, shows what Uber is up to. And the real the theme of the video is it's closer than you think.
this year at CES, one of the, I think, the, uh, the marquee items of the show was Bell Helicopter showed their kind of first version of what they call Bell Nexus. So Bell is a partner with Uber, and this is actually um, the vehicle that they're going to be testing here uh, in the next year. It's actually going to be one of the possibilities for something like Uber. He was there, you were able to go sit in it. It's just, you feel like you just came out of a sci-fi movie sitting in it. It can feed five people. Uh, can land on as small as a 40 by 40 pad, can fly at 150 miles. They're all electric power with an inverter, so it can actually use a gas kind of inverter to actually allow it to go farther. Um, and they say that they're going to be up running in the network by 2023. So as you look at this, what I tell you is the common vehicles are, are rapidly evolving here. I really believe the first place we're going to see a lot of traction is on these smaller ground-based drones for delivery, especially in local marketplaces. You're really going to understand what role they play in your organization. Visualizing expertise is another disruptive capability that we're spending a lot of time on at PepsiCo, whether it's real world, Daiquiri, Beam, or HoloLens, real world we're testing in our manufacturing sites. It's a tethered kind of kind of virtual headset. The one that we has really opened people's eyes for us is the one from Microsoft called HoloLens. Around this concept we call virtual experts. So the idea that Instead of having an engineer in each site or somebody that knows every in and out of a cooler or a frozen case, et cetera, to be able to have somebody virtually transport to that store and provide advice can actually be done through these headsets that are not VR, but they're augmented reality. So they're actually, you're seeing the, the stuff around you, but it's being supplemented with additional data. Here's a real example of a HoloLens implementation with an elevator company that'll give you an idea what they're capable of. The scenario we have developed is really about dispatching a service technician using HoloLens in very different kind of ways. So as soon as the technician puts on his HoloLens, he already sees, I have a call here, I need to go to this elevator, and then actually sees a 3D picture of the elevator that he's going to work on, and then he can zoom it into a part that will offer you also training opportunities. He goes to the job site prepared, probably better prepared than ever before, because he has relevant data available to him in the best format possible, and in a variety of ways he can tailor the data towards his need. The technician puts on his HoloLens looking at the elevator, sees the historical notes first, so what has actually happened with this elevator before, he already has all the information right there without having to look for it. It saves a lot of time and a lot of stress and effort. To get some information on the blood for desk of about the task orders he has to carry out. So they just safety alerts or the elevator. He pulls on a 3D the replication of that part, pulls it out in an exposed view, and can actually see which part is making the problem. A major advantage of the whole is of course that we are hands-free and we never had the experience and the capability before. In the past the technician needed both of his hands to upgrade the laptop. Now it just has a small lens. One of the most important capabilities we see with small lens is that we can trigger a remote call to a subject matter expert. Call oh, there. Hey Jeff, how are you doing? I'm uh, replacing the driver out here, but I kind of want you to check a couple things out. Okay, let me take a look. The JT3 is in the right position, and your motor is disconnected, so you're good to go. You can see the power it has by allowing somebody to literally be there with you, see what you're seeing, and actually give and guidance and directions. So think of all of the equipment in a typical grocery store. Being able to have one or two people centrally located that they're the experts, and a device that somebody could put on to be able to troubleshoot. So wearables, again, if you're not looking at it and you should, they are going to play a big role in adding a whole new capability, especially around this remote expert in driving productivity and new insights. And there are definitely applications across grocery and CPG. The last one, artificial intelligence. Um, a lot of people are, I think, just starting to cut their teeth in the space and machine learning. But there are a lot of consumer-grade artificial intelligence and AI systems out there, whether it's Siri, Cortana, Google Home, Alexa being one of the most popular ones. If you're just trying to get your footing on it, there's a great white paper out there, again, available on the, the internet. It was done by BCG and MIT. It really brings up kind of state of the industry, kind of where people are at. A lot of people are talking about it, but when you really get into it, very few people have actually implemented AI or machine learning in a way where they just say, hey, you're delivering results. We're 
we're testing. I would say we're probably in the middle of that kind of curve where we're seeing some really good stuff, but you know, right about at the point of starting to implement some stuff. But it takes some time uh, to get these up and running and tune them. Um, and AI isn't just AI behind the curtain, right? There's apps like Slice. You may have heard of this. It's, uh, a lot of people are basically white labeling it, people like Neiman Marcus, et cetera. But it's basically AI recognition on your phone. So being able to point at, for example, grocery items. Instead of having to key anything in, just point to them to add them to your shopping list or add them to your cart. Neiman Marcus has a great uh, video on, online to look at. And then Smart Glass that has AI technology built in it. NRF, there's a company called OuterNet, generally, that actually showed how you could use glass, whether it's in the front of the store or whether it's a, you know, on a sneeze shield in, in, in a, the deli case, to drive not only consumer engagement, but to understand who's actually there. So really, when you're looking at AI, where do you start? Simple things, things like virtual assistant. I've seen a lot of folks actually put AI agents in where they actually first try to go handle the, the call from the consumer. If they can, it goes to a live call. But the AI agent actually stays on and listens. So the next time they hear that, they know how to handle it. Uh, generating insights, basically mining data, large data sets. Automating manual processes is a good place to start. And then last, unlocking relationships and unstructured data. You have a lot of big data sets that actually have key fields. AI engines are great to lay on top of them. The most important piece to get started, you have to have some reasonable hygiene in your data, meaning it has to be in one place, it has to be clean, you have to understand what the, the column headings and fields are to be able to access them. And there's great sites to just get you thinking. There's a site uh, by Google called Google AI Experiments, and it's just a whole kind of hodgepodge of automated things that AI engines can do, but it's a great place to get your kind of creative juices kind of flowing here. If you haven't seen it, go out there and play with it. So as I, I kind, of, kind of wrap things up today, I would tell you, hopefully we've done a little today to aspire you to, to create a vision of how we engage differently with the consumer, how we operate our stores differently to be more effective, more efficient, and most importantly, more engaging for that shopper and consumer. And look at the technologies. Not every one of these technologies will work for every retailer or every company, but I guarantee you there's a handful in what we talked about today that will work in your organization. Um, challenge yourself to, to think big, right? Remember the Postmates Operations VP, right? You know, we sometimes moan about we get our new plan for the year and it's a 5% or 10% productivity target. He made a shift to actually reduce his last mile logistics cost by 80 to 90%, right? So find those handful of ones that really can drive a significant change and, and almost approach it, not that you have to do it, but don't be kind of, you know, limited by what you have today. Say, if I could really do it differently, here's how I would structure it. And then last, transform. Right? Set big goals, you know, that's one thing we try to do at PepsiCo is really challenge ourselves to do what we think is impossible, at least get the goal out there, and more often than not, we find out that we can unlock the creativity of folks and actually, uh, in many cases, land those visions that we lay out. But really become that transformation agent in your organization. That's the only way these things come to life. So, as we started with the movies, I thought it would only be appropriate to end with something from the movies. I appreciate you listening today. I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. <laughs>